today is I'll quickly give a bit of an introduction to Digital Bridge, uh, and then I'll talk a bit about the five key trends that, sort of as we see it, are really shaping the way that we think about digital infrastructure investment today. So, Digital Bridge today, um, we are effectively the leading asset manager for the digital infrastructure economy. So we specialise in investment in digital infrastructure. It's 95% plus of, of what we do. Um, today we sit a little below 70 billion US dollars in assets under management. We have 30 different portfolio companies globally uh, in the digital infrastructure space. We have about 300 staff overall, of whom over 100 uh, investment management professionals. Uh, and we have offices, we're based in Boca Raton in Florida. We have offices in New York, LA, London, Singapore, Luxembourg, uh, and actually at, at today Madrid as well. Uh, so we've recently opened that office. Uh, I run Europe for, for Digital Bridge. I joined around 18 months ago uh, to, uh, to really drive our, our growth, um, supporting the existing team here who have you know, built a pretty significant portfolio over the last four years. So what we do, we've made a deliberate choice to go deeper rather than wider in the, in the infrastructure space. So as I said before, we're a digital infrastructure specialist, but we look to deploy capital to all parts of the digital infrastructure going chain. So our largest um, strategy, if you like, is what we call digital infrastructure equity, which is sort of a classic uh, value-add infrastructure strategy where we're, for the most part, supporting growing platforms, supporting a great deal of capital expenditure in the digital infrastructure space. And I'll talk about some of those drivers a little bit later. Um, we also have a credit strategy, we lead to digital infrastructure businesses. We have a core strategy which buys mature businesses. Uh, and then at the other end of the value chain, we have uh, liquid and venture strategies which um, eventually obviously support some of the newer businesses that we're, uh, we're starting to see emerging in the space. So why digital infrastructure? Um, sorry, I need to look at my phone for my slides because they're not in front of me. Uh, this won't be a surprise to you know, those of you who have spent any time on the space, right? There's sort of no, no rocket science here. I mean, we all know how essential digital infrastructure has become. I think you know, COVID demonstrated that, but frankly, you know, I've been working in this space for more than 20 years, and I think the um, perhaps eureka moment, at least in the UK, for certainly investment committees, was you know, probably about seven years ago now, when a number of the rail companies were having really significant issues. And then O2 went out for less than one day, and the disruption was far, far more significant. And I think that's when people, at least in my world, started to realise, oh wow, this stuff is actually really essential and perhaps we haven't realised the true nature of how essential it was. Uh, we're clearly seeing you know, a huge push on mobility. Right? 5G for now will be 5G plus and then eventually 6G. And I think you know, for most consumers and business users, frankly, we're only right now, I think, starting to realise the promise of what mobility was meant to be back in the sort of mid 2000s the sort of idea of internet everywhere if you like and you know mobility truly acting as an optimizer for business um, uh, in particular uh, what we do is we really take it we, we, i guess we call it pick and shovel but we're essentially uh, investing in the physical assets that underlie the networks that support everything that end users do with digital infrastructure so you know, we're, we're not a tech investor, right? we, don't, we don't come from that perspective. We obviously you know, need to understand technology um, in a very big way and you know, we do spend a lot of time thinking and talking uh, about those, those big trends and I'll talk about some of those later. Um, but you know, certainly outside of venture strategy we don't invest in, in technology, we invest in assets that you can sort of knock on. Five are not so easy, but you can get one. And then finally, the reason that you know our investors like this asset class is that it is resilient. 
Uh, it's been you know, proven through a couple of economic cycles now, admittedly the last being the most important, um, and it is uncorrelated. You know, certainly what we see in the tower sector, the small cell sector, uh, the data center sector in particular, uh, highly uncorrelated from, um, I guess, what you'd broadly call the real economy. Right? The, the secular trends that are driving growth in digital infrastructure uh, are quite unlike the trends that are driving many other sectors. I think that, you know, the, the one other sector that might have a similarity would be renewable energy. Where we're, you know, right now, in both digital and, renew and renewable energy, undergoing a massive shift from effectively obsolete technologies to a brand new set of technologies that are expected to support our networks for the next, you know, hopefully 50 years. So before I talk about sort of the five um, themes that are really driving us, it's, I, I sort of think it's helpful just to look back and you know reflect on how relatively recent you know the, the digital world, if you like, that we live in today is. Um, and I'm going to pick on a familiar fact, Peter. How many um, apps were in the Apple App Store 15 years ago? Incorrect. <laughs> there were in fact none. The Apple App Store only launched in July of 2008 with 500 apps. Right? Today, if you put the Apple and the Google App Stores together, there's four and a half million apps. Right? So just think about you know, how that, our world has changed over those 15 years uh, in terms of the adoption of these technologies. Uh, and therefore, what that means in terms of the network demand that we're seeing across, you know, all of the networks, fixed and mobile, uh, and then on top of that, into the compute piece, which has been become, you know, almost entirely cloud-based for a lot of what we do, um, of, you know, in both business and consumer use. And so, the big trends as we sort of look at them, I'll start with, I guess, the three sort of trends in broadly speaking, technology: 5G and AI explosion. Um, and the growth in edge. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what the implications have, have been there for CapEx and, and demand trends and, and therefore CapEx. Um, and then a little bit about you know, what we're seeing in terms of, of valuation in, in current markets. So just very quickly, um, on a global perspective, I think everybody's probably aware that you know, 5G globally is only about 50% rolled out. I mean, as you would expect, rolled out into you know, generally higher socioeconomic markets for now, but you know, a, a lot that will be continue to be rolled out globally. Probably more importantly, we're still in many markets in a phase of you know, basically purely coverage. Right? I mean, even in the UK, we do not have ubiquitous 5G coverage today. Uh, and even when we do have it, networks sometimes aren't wholly reliable. You know, sometimes it's a better experience on 4G than 5G, which is you know, a little bit scary perhaps. Uh, so we are going to enter into a phase over the next few years of significant densification. Um, and that densification is occurring in a world where telecom operator budgets are massively constrained. Right? So the need for private capital to come in to support the growth of these networks is higher than it's, it's ever been. The second thing that you know, we're really thinking about really deeply at the moment, uh, and it's obviously a very significant change from where we were you know, perhaps two years ago, is AI, uh, and, well, I, I'm, personally I don't like the term, so I think it encompasses you know, a number of different compute models that you know, perhaps are all intended for different uses, but will fundamentally define and disrupt practically every industry that you can think of. Um, so, the, the approaches that AI will bring for optimization, particularly across business, across manufacturing, across logistics, um, across um, financial services in particular, uh, is really the future of business. Right? And equally importantly, the demand to place that intelligence everywhere um, will grow very, very quickly. Uh, so this is, this is a big thing in the way we, we're thinking about deployment of uh, particularly mobile networks, uh, cloud at the core, and cloud at the edge. Uh, you know, the, these, are, these are three 
I guess the three main sectors where we think AI is going to really drive very significant change in the way that we architect networks and therefore for capital deployment. So just quickly, you know, who, who, who is in the value chain? I mean, obviously I just spoke about end users and use cases. Uh, uh, you know, we all know the names of, uh, of the various platforms that have been out there, notably Chat GPT, but you know, it won't be too long before sort of everybody you can think of on the next layer down um, has a, a proper platform out there and you know there'll be as always a, a fight for dominance. Um, there won't necessarily be a dominant player. There could, you know, we could well see that different AI platforms or long language format platforms have different optimization for the various use cases that um, that business in particular comes up with. Uh, the software players, obviously, I just sort of talked about those who are, are building these platforms and ultimately looking to commercialize these platforms. The implications for the hardware manufacturers are quite significant, right? I mean, we've, we've literally just been through, um, and you know, continues to be a bit the case today, a huge shortage in GPUs globally. Uh, and we've seen you know, some of uh, other people in the real estate sector, you know, we've, we've seen the likes of Brookfield co-invest with Intel into the production of silicon because of the shortages um, of capacity in, in that piece of the network. And then finally on the, on the digital infra side, where you know, all of this compute needs not just somewhere for the compute to be done, but it needs to be transported to the end user in whatever form and format that is, whether that's a, a, a business or a consumer and fixed or mobile. Right? You know, th th these are the, um, the, the drivers that we really see uh, pushing in particular the data center industry over the next at least five years and arguably the next decade. The third trend I talked about uh, the edge before. So you know, fundamentally, what does it mean? It means pushing compute, or you know, in, in the world of AI intelligence, if you like, closer to the end user. You know, why do we do that? Why, why do businesses want that? Why are the likes of Microsoft and Amazon uh, and Google looking to deploy more closer to the end user? It's to improve performance at the end of the day. So, what does the edge mean? Um, People have been talking about edge in the data center space for a long time. The reality is it means a lot of things to a lot of different people, and it can mean different things for different use cases. Right? Some people would, would have, you know, even probably 18 months ago, defined the edge as almost anything that's not Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, and Paris. Right? Today, many of those markets are, you know, perhaps not, certainly not tier one, but even tier two markets would perhaps not be referred to as the edge, but the likes of, you know, Vienna or Athens, you know, how do we think of those markets, right? Those are still millions of people. When you push down into some of the, not micro edge, but lower level edge uh, applications, you know, we've seen through one of our platforms, customers ask for 30 to 35 locations across just the UK, right? Looking to push uh, compute out to those 30 locations to drive effectively sub one millisecond latency to the end users in, in that instance for a consumer use case. Uh, so this is growing extremely rapidly. Uh, it's growing based on um, both performance but equally importantly here in Europe around data regulation and the importance <coughs> of housing data in market. Uh, the edge market is growing you know, somewhat faster than I guess what you would previously refer to as the tier one market, though you know, make no mistake. By the current very high rates, uh, so you know they're effectively unprecedented. Um, and cloud spend in general continues to, to grow at huge rates. Right? I mean, last year was a, a record year for cloud at about 29% revenue growth for the major players. This year was forecast at about 22%. I mean, let's see how that plays out. But that is by any measure still effectively exponential growth as we we look at cloud outsourcing and, and increasing cloud utilisation. So this is a little bit to, to what I said before, right? the, the way we think about edge is really defined by the use case. So this is just some examples and you know, some of our thoughts about where, where things are today. So you know, I guess what you call the sort of historical uh, view of data centres is really what we think of as being these core hyperscale data centres, right? the sorts of, of assets that 
we have developed and, and operated for a long time for core hyperscale customers through our Vantage platform, for example. So you, you know, you're typically talking about deployments of 10 megawatts plus. I think in today's world that would arguably be quite a small deployment, um, and maybe we should change that number. Uh, and that's driven by you know core hyperscale usage, um, core cloud, so Azure platforms, for, for, for example, with Microsoft. Uh, sometimes high performance compute, that's a, a relatively small piece of the market, and obviously storage, which is, you know, tends to be frankly a little bit less location sensitive. And then as we move up into things like content delivery, certainly telehealth, um, video monitoring, and 5G and backhaul management, you start to see demand for cloud being placed closer to the end user. And so we've seen huge demand um, for regional edge uh, and network proximity edge pushing less than 10 milliseconds to the user. Just conscious of time, so I'll flick on a bit. Uh, we've talked, I talked about that previous slide, but I think it's important to recognise the demand and what that means for CapEx. Right? I mean, just here in Europe, um, one of the network operators associations in 21 put out a forecast that we needed 500 billion euros spent across Europe to finish 5G and gigabit fibre um, just across the EU. Uh, that, that excludes data centres altogether. So you know, we estimate about 500 billion in spend globally per annum in digital infrastructure. That's obviously not coming from operator or hyperscaler balance sheets in whole. I mean, obviously some of that is debt, but the opportunities for private capital in the space are extremely exciting still. Then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about you know, where, where markets are today. Um, and I guess the way we characterize it is a return to rationality. Right? I think in 2020 in the digital infrastructure space, people were scratching their heads about you know, how prices got justified. Uh, I think in 2021, and in particular last year, right, that return to rationality happened very, very, very fast. And I guess it's sort of amazing how scarcity of capital uh, can do that to markets. The consequence of that, you know, certainly as we, we come into this year, is going to be the reality, very low m and volumes, right? Always happens in these sorts of cycles, particularly in a cycle that is characterised by high credit costs. Right? So, this year will be, a, I think, a quiet year for everybody. I suspect what we'll see is sellers adjusting price expectations, again, as we see in every cycle, and a return to, to higher volumes uh, next year. Something that you know we're excited about is we're raising capital right now uh, to return to a market that is both rationally priced and, as I presented before, full of opportunity to, to deploy capital. And finally, just quickly to round up on the, the way we approach it, uh, I guess fundamentally, and it's probably characterised in those two crosses actually, we, we're not interested in bad businesses at whatever price, right? We're looking for good businesses with con consolidation plays and the opportunity to deploy additional capital across the value spectrum, right? You know, we're, we're, we're very good with platforms, we're very good with capital deployment, it's really at the heart of what we do and to us presents the, the huge opportunity in digital infrastructure for the next decade. So I'll thank you there. Uh, I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, I doubt we've got time for questions. I'm just looking. Okay. Is, there, is there any questions? It sounds like we can take one. Maybe. Yeah, I'll oh, well, there we go. We've saved you 20 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. 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 Thanks,